Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today, nearly live in Ottawa, Ontario. We are back on the show after a bit of a hiatus through the early part of the spring. Just took a few weeks to refresh. And I hope everyone out there is doing well. I thank you for the patience that you've all showed with the uh, with the show not being here. But we are back here as we gear up for the summer season. And we're back with a great episode for you today. Looking back on the 1897-98 gold rush in the Klondike. This is a period where once there were reports of gold in the region, you had over 100,000 people rush to the north with the hopes of finding their fortune. And of course, very few did. It, it is a moment in time where there's a romantic vision in the popular imagination of people going and prospectors finding gold. But if you look at what actually happened, you have a lot of suffering, you have death, you have violence, poverty, certainly it exacerbates colonialism in the region. And it's just a period where the imagination, the popular memory of it doesn't necessarily fit with what happened on the ground. And it is the subject of a new book by Brian Kastner titled Stampede, Gold Fever and Disaster in the Klondike. This is a really good book. I had a chance to read it and it's written in a, in a narrative format and it really gets into the individuals who were there, the the characters as they're described in the book, but they're real people. And, and Brian went out, did a lot of research, went to archives, and he tells this story in a very gripping, powerful way. So it's very different from a traditional history, which makes sense because Brian is not a traditional academic historian. He's actually a, a veteran of the American military, served in Iraq, has written books about his military experience, and uh, you could see sort of a, a bit of the journalistic impulse that he has. He, he works primarily as a journalist now. And we get into his background and how that influences writing. But if you're coming to this book, don't expect a traditional history. It, it almost reads, and we'll talk about it on the show, almost like a historical fiction type, type work, because it has that narrative structure to it. But it is all based off of the archival and secondary research. So it's really very well done. And like I said, just uh, really gets into this era where the imagination, the popular memory of it doesn't necessarily fit with what happened back during that 1897 gold rush. So that's what we're talking about on the show today. Very much enjoyed this discussion. Hope you will as well. So let's get right to it. Here's my chat with Brian Kastner. All right, and Brian Kastner joins us now from Buffalo, New York. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. I'm excited to have you here. Again, the book is Stampede, Gold Fever and Disaster in the Klondike. So I, I want to start by asking uh, Brian, and I mean this with the utmost respect and admiration for you, because I've read your bio that was sent to me, and I, I looked into some of your past publications. And I got to say, if I had seen those without the context of this particular book, if you'd give me a hundred guesses, I don't know if I would have gotten to the Klondike for the subject of your next book. So how did you come to this? Given your background, you are an Iraq war vet. You've, you've done a lot of work on, on war. I could see a little bit on some of the Western stuff that you've done that maybe that's how you get to the Klondike. But, but for you personally, what was the journey to get to this particular book on the Klondike? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you a fully satisfying answer, <laughs> except I, I think that, um, you know, all writers and all people certainly are interested in a variety of topics. And I just feel fortunate that I've been able to write about a bunch of different things. I certainly got started. Uh, I'm a military Iraq veteran myself. I was a bomb technician. I wrote a couple books about conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I wrote a lot of magazine stories about that. And then I wanted to branch off and do different things. And I am I am from Buffalo. I feel kind of half Canadian. I, I've i been in, interested in Canadian history and stuff too. And then I ended up writing a book about Alexander McKenzie, um, 
that book is Disappointment River. And I, you know, I love the outdoors and I got to do a giant canoe trip and do the Mackenzie River and paddle to the Arctic Ocean. And that was a ton of fun. And Alaska is right next door. And I have a lot of friends in Alaska. Um, I love Alaska. I've been many times. Uh, I've, you know, I love that part of the world. Obviously, the story of the Klondike is like a half Alaska story, half Yukon story, right? It's both American and Canadian. So I guess it appeals to me for that. Like I said, growing up in Buffalo, but I also think that there's some of these stories that I'm drawn to from a military, like veteran perspective, which may not be obvious. So like, for example, the Disappointment River book, the fur traders who went west in Canada, you know, at the end of the 18th century, were a lot of them were veterans of um, the French and Indian War, what we call in the United States, right? Like they were veterans on the frontier here. Uh, they fought in those wars and then they kind of wanted to escape and they went west and they did other things. In the American Western story, it's really a post-Civil War story. It's a story of Civil War veterans who go west and are involved in violence, and but also mining and the settlement and everything else. And the Klondike, from an American perspective, is really a story of the last Western frontier. And a lot of the people involved uh, initially in the Klondike were Civil War veterans, you know, generals trying to reclaim lost glory. So I think I see some of that through, I don't know, I understand that lens totally. Uh, maybe I'm doing a little bit of that myself, you know, transitioning from military writing to more outdoor writing. So that's a that's a kind of a, a long, complicated answer. I'm not sure it even answers the question, though. I just I'm curious. And the story, once I got into it, once I started to read about the Klondike, it's it's a disaster movie. And there are so many ways that people are injured and killed and um, you know, so many disasters to write about that I really felt like it it matched my, you know, kind of what I'm good at when it comes to research and writing. Well, th that sort of leads me into the the next question then, because as I am wont to do as a historian, I look at the back of the book first. Whenever I, I get a book, I'm always curious to look at bibliography, sources, where, where things come from, especially in a book like this that isn't sort of a traditional History takes a very different approach to this to this type of material, and yet you have primary sources in there. You have visited archives. You did newspaper research. There's a ton of secondary sources in there. So, what was the approach then, as, as someone who isn't a professional historian? Obviously, your background is quite different from someone who who is working as a professional historian, particularly at an academic institution. So what was that approach for you to dive into this level of primary research that would be quite different from the other work that you had done in the past? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm not an academic historian. I'm not a professional historian, and I would never pretend to be. Um, and I'm not sure that what I bring to the Klondike uh, story is like, um, I didn't discover some new archives. I'm not bringing out some brand new source that, that nobody has seen before. I wouldn't even claim that I'm doing, I'm not doing original research. What I'm doing is um, I'm just trying to write the story in a different way, which I, I think appeals to my strengths. And, and, and that is narrative uh, and that is finding details. And that's, you know, trying to get to the spirit of the thing and what it felt like, and just, you know, trying to tell a, a good story. I think though, from like a, from a research perspective to try to answer your question more specifically, um, I do a lot of interviews and I, I know how to interview someone and I know how to take interview notes and combine a person's perspective of what happened with outside sources to try to get at the truth and not just, you know, take their word as the last word. Um, and so I really tried to take the letters, uh, people's journals, um, you know, uh, memoirs that were published by families afterwards. Obviously, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants when it comes to, uh, you know, historians that have gone and really mined all of the details of Kate Carmack or George Carmack or Robert Henderson, or whatever. Like, you know, there's been some really great work done that I am trying to then take and turn into a more, you know, narrative form. Um, but I look at their journals and memoirs and oral histories as like my own interview notes. And then 
okay, I've got this oral history from Belinda Mulrooney um, that was never really turned into a book, but I have the pages from, um, you know, from the archive. Can I turn this into a, uh, well, I guess in the journalism world, we'd call it a TikTok, like a, a moment by moment, like narrative of what she was doing in a particular place on a particular day, you know, say during the fire in Dawson City. What can I, what can I accurately say about what she was doing you know, to turn it into his narrative as much as possible. So why the decision then to go with the style of writing that you use in the book, that that narrative style, when you could make an argument that this type of a, a book and the research that you did could make for a quote unquote traditional history. And especially given your past writing based off of, for example, some of the, the personal material and your personal experiences is, that you have drawn on in your writing. What was that process like for you to craft this particular narrative using the sources in this more of a, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I hate to use the word like, you know, fiction or, or anything like that because, you know, it's based on reality. So right. you know, just, just crafting this narrative in this format compared to, say, a traditional history. Yeah, I mean, that's really, I mean, again, I think that's what, if there's something I can bring to it, it's the storytelling aspect. And it's certainly not fiction. There's not every single word in there is fact checked and, you know, as true as I can possibly make it and not, um, I'm not trying to indulge in any hyperbole. I'm, I'm trying to adhere to absolutely positively, uh, you know, the, the truth and all of it. Um, the, it's definitely nonfiction, right? So, but to not, like, why not write a traditional history? I mean, there have been traditional histories uh, written of, obviously, Pierre Burton's is the most famous, uh, but there's plenty of others. There's, I feel like that's been done. And, um, and then since then, there's been a lot of individual traditional histories of major figures. Um, and so if I'm going to bring something new, it's not going to be new information it's going to be a new way to tell the story and try to tell it from the point of view of the people that lived it as much as possible and get down on the trail as much as possible. And what was Jack London doing minute by minute as he was piloting the boat, you know, through the White Horse Rapids? We we know that because he wrote he wrote about it afterwards and there were people on his trip that kept journals. And so trying to recreate that, you know, from the narrative is I mean, that that was really uh, my goal. And I think, you know, what, again, what I've done on previous books, I, th I think it's what I bring to the topic. And, and yeah, that's why I, I obviously didn't want to use the word fiction because it's it's not fiction. But it if I, again, and I mean this as a compliment, it almost reads as a historical fiction, if that makes any sense, that sort of narrative storytelling that you you get into that is so different from that traditional history. So when you look at it as a writer, how do you conceive of the people that you're writing about when you're in the moment as you're crafting the prose going through it? Because I noticed at the front, it says, here's a list of characters. And, and I'm always right. sort of struck by the word character. So how do you conceive of the people as you are writing and, and telling their story? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, um, I mean, kind of, I mean, what you're getting at is there's this compliment, you know, reads like a novel. Um, yeah. And I, but I think what that really means is paying attention to the words and trying to tell the story, you know, as well as you possibly can. So what I try to do is have a lot when I, well, the first step is picking characters, like who can I really bring to life? Um, you know, there are plenty of people that I wished I could bring to life that I simply couldn't. Diamond Tooth Gertie, who is maybe one of the most famous, uh, what they were called good time girls, you know, who danced and performed in Dawson City, did not leave enough material that I felt like I could recreate what she was doing. Um, there, there's plenty of other people, um, people like that in the Klondike, but people that left significant material, that left memoirs or the oral history or other historians had really dug up their letters or everything else, you know, people who left that material where I could then approach it with humility and say, okay, what do I know? And then what, um, you know, what can I prove out of what they say? And I, I'm really judicious by the words think for me, the, you know, to say that a character thought this at a certain time to me is an extremely high standard. 
So how are you sure of that? Well, you're only sure of that if they tell you that's what they were yeah. thinking at that time. <laughs> Or if if Jack London, you know, there's been there's been incredible work done on Jack London where scholars have been able to link specific passages in certain short stories to specific places, say, on the Stuart River where he wintered over. You know, there you can start to like piece together. Ah, OK, here's here's how all this stuff fits together. Um, but but yeah, all the dialogue. I mean, the only dialogue in the book is dialogue that appears in somebody's journal or in somebody's letter. It's nothing you know, nothing's invented there. It's um, so what you really need is that real depth of material that, okay, I can, I can stay with this character and I can be really confident. Tap and Adney, who was the correspondent for Harper's, you know, wrote an enormous book about his trip, you know, so we really have the day by day of what he was doing there. You, you can recreate it in a, um, you know, using other sources and then also his observations. And how much of your desire to tell that story or tell these stories based off of what they were thinking on off of these primary sources is a response perhaps to at least my perception of some of the literature about this era. The, there's a romantic sense, I think, of the gold rush and, and the Klondike. And you go out there and you just have your, your pan and you're searching for gold and people strike rich. And so there's this imagery that surrounds it uh, of wealth and joy and and good times and the you know, speakeasies all this all this kind of stuff that goes into the public memory or the uh, of these moments in time and yet the book really does highlight the challenges and certainly the riches there were not universal and they weren't even the majority of people who who went out that that got rich so how much of the way in which you're telling these stories through those primary sources is a desire to want to be authentic to the individuals who lived and experienced this era. Yeah, that's probably my primary motivation. I mean, and that's my primary motiva- motivation in just about everything I write. It's like, what's what's the point of taking a big trip? Um, uh, what's Tracy Kidder uh, in his in his book about writing? Um, Tracy Kidder is a great writer, but he, when he was starting out, he pitched stories to his editor, and I believe that the editor's response was, "Oh no." more pretty words about pretty places. Mm. Who needs pretty words about pretty places, right? Like the the point of doing um, the research for this book or to take the trips I do and then write about it is to demystify and demythologize and and try to get at, you know, more of the authentic experience. My, <laughs> my canoe trip recreating Mackenzie's uh, trip for the last book uh, was miserable. And I, I tried to say that. You know, and my my writing about military topics is not glorification. It's pretty bloody and ugly. And and I think that I mean, that's truly what motivates me as a writer is is to go and find, you know, find some nugget of truth and bring it back and say, you know what? The trip was really like this. And and I agree with you on the romance of it. And I mean, there's a couple ways to challenge that romance. There's there's the fact that, like you said, almost nobody got rich. And um, at least in the United States, there was the Great Panic of 1893. There was, you know, a, a, a tremendous economic depression. And this and there was the Gilded Age and all this. Right. And then the inequities between rich and poor that people were trying to escape was just recreated in the Klondike. It was the same percentages of people who got rich. Mm-hmm. Another way to demystify it is just the number of people that died. Something like 100,000 or more went on on the gold rush, and only a third or 40% made it to Dawson City. And that other 60%, yes, a large proportion of them just turned around and didn't make it. But many of them died, and we have no idea how many died. It's, it could be in the tens of thousands that died. Once you start to add up all the overland routes from Edmonton, and up the Mackenzie River, and then people that were trapped in the ice, and all the shipwrecks leaving Victoria and Seattle. Um, I mean, it could really, the death toll could just be horrific. And then I guess a, a third way of demystifying or demythologizing it is really the way Indigenous people and women were treated. The amount of violence against women that I saw just kind of waiting to be written about um, from these oral histories and memoirs was just incredible. And that is not something I read in the traditional histories. 
And, you know, the number of indigenous people uh, that were lynched, um, you know, and blamed for various crimes, etc., uh, was really large, too. And of course, you know, the land was taken uh, as well for mines. And so that all those things are not stuff that I was reading in, you know, the traditional histories, which was another motivation to write about it. Well, that colonial aspect is is interesting, right? Because obviously, really, the whole history of, of the Americas is one of violence towards indigenous peoples. When you have these moments of, of expansion of colonial uh, individuals going west, and yet the methodology here is, of course, using a lot of the material that was left to try and get into people's heads at the time and try to really express what they were feeling as they were going west. So in in the list of characters, you do have uh, Skookum Jim, uh, a Tagish man of great strength. Uh, you have uh, Tagish Charlie, his uh, nephew. So how did you try to get into those characters and present their perspective and, and what material was available for them? It, it's extremely challenging. And I think I mostly... Um, I, I don't know. I don't want to say I, I failed, but like that's where I, I had my greatest struggles. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, when it comes to Skookum Jim uh, specifically, uh, he appears in the oral histories of the Carcross um, Tagish First Nation. And so there's been a lot of work done by um, uh, uh, Crookshank is one of the authors, but there's others who have really compiled a lot of these oral histories from the area. And, you know, he, he and his discovery of the gold appears there. And then there's been a, a lot of, you know, traditional stories uh, that have come out about, well, why did he find the gold? And it was because he was visited by wealth woman and was really lucky. And so there, there is within um, the First Nation up there their own story about how this went. And I want to make sure I honored that. Um, Kate Carmack, who was... In, I mean, she was called Kate by her husband, George, because he couldn't pronounce her name. And so he renamed her Kate. Um, You know, she was illiterate. And there is a single letter that I found that she had dictated um, to her husband as George was leaving her. Uh, And it is an absolutely heartbreaking letter and says, you know, I I tried to quote as much of it as I could, essentially, that made sense in the text, um, because it was one of the very few times, you know, that she could speak for herself. So, the answer to your question is it was it was very challenging. I'm not. Um, I wish I could have done more. And the record is thin, and so uh, you try to use the oral histories from the people themselves as much as you can. And it also leads into the question too of just overall when we're talking about these colonial issues, and, and you mentioned violence towards women as well. The idea of language and tone within the book, and there is something at the start that says that you are trying to provide a, as authentic as possible a, a sense of what happened at the time. And therefore, some of the language could be difficult for modern readers to look at. So I, I'm just curious, what was the discussion like between you, the editors, and thinking about how to properly use language, use the terminology of the day while recognizing where we are in 2021 and a need to ensure that this book can be read by everybody? Yes. Um, I mean, I, I took, I'd like to think I took a lot of care on that and gave it a lot of thought. And the answer is to use the words when absolutely, absolutely necessary, when it was a pop, you know, a proper name of someone. Yeah. Um, there was, there's a, a white man from Alabama who's called N-word Jim. That was his, that was his name. Um, so we, if we had to use his name, we used it, but then not use it gratuitously and not, um, and not repeat it, you know, as uh, any more than absolutely necessary. I mean, I, I tried as much as possible to always use the language of the time. And that's not just on epithets. That's also, you know, just what words that they use for everything. The place where, you know, sex workers were called uh, good time girls and soiled doves and sporting girls, and they lived in cribs. And so I use those words. Um, I tried to avoid modern words. You know, Soapy Smith was essentially a mobster and he ran a racketeering scheme, but the word racketeering was not a word in 1897. So I didn't use the word racketeering. I tried as much as possible to keep it in the language of the time. I'm sure it wasn't perfect, but 
you know, the goal in, a, in this kind of narrative is to immerse the reader in all of that as much as you possibly can. Yeah, and, and another side of that, too, is the financials of it. You know, you, there's a note at the start that says just multiply all the numbers by 30, basically, uh, for right. 2021 numbers, which is kind of I, I kind of appreciated that going into it, that kind of note. Uh, so, so I enjoyed that. Yeah. So that way, when somebody pulls out $100,000 from the ground, you know, you can say, oh, that's actually three million bucks. Right. right. So it's um, yeah. I, I, again, I, I think it's it's a matter of tone and intent. And if you're going to write a narrative history, you can't or, you know, I didn't break the fourth wall, so to speak, until the afterward. I tried to to keep the story. You know, what I told myself was I want to keep the story within itself. I want to keep the, you know, the story true to itself, you know, chapters one through 10 all the way through, you know, as kind of a self-contained vessel. And then in the note up front that I'm going to use words that I don't like. And in the afterward in the back where I tell you where everybody ended up, you know, that was the time um, to be speaking from 2021, so to speak. Yeah. Now, the other thing that I really noticed as I was going through the book and, and looking through all the characters and thinking about this is, you know, you're in Buffalo, you're an American, I'm here in Ottawa, I'm a Canadian. You, this book, though, doesn't feel like either a Canadian history book or an American history book because you have characters from all over. You have locals, you have people from Nova Scotia, uh, you have people from California. Like it, This really feels like a cross-section of North America in the late 19th century. So uh, I'm just curious for you, do you conceive of this book as being something that is almost beyond the borders of North America, that this is just the landmass and we all are here, we live here, there, th there's the colonial tension that exists, certainly, but this strikes me as a book that goes beyond, well beyond any sort of national border between the two countries. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. Um, actually, I mean, yeah, I, I have a Canadian editor and an American editor, um, and uh, and I value the input from both and to make it right for both. And I think, I mean, it's kind of a throwaway thing, but seriously, growing up in Buffalo, um, you watch Hockey Night in Canada and drink Labatt Blue, and it feels, and you spend a lot of time in Canada. And so it feels, I don't want to overstate that, but like, yeah, my, my goal is to write a story that works for both because it is, I mean, it's genuinely uh, a story about Canadians and Americans and Europeans, new immigrants, um, and the indigenous people up there. And the border was kind of set, but I mean, honestly, Sam Steele of the Northwest, um, uh, you know, the Northwest police the border at some point was where he said it was and where he put the machine guns to keep the Americans out. Right. So it, I mean, a lot of that was in flux in a very genuine way. The prospectors themselves kind of ignored the law on both sides when it was convenient um, and traveled up and down the Yukon. And so sometimes they were in uh, that time, the Northwest territories, and sometimes they were in Alaska. Um, I mean, this is something I tried. I know I keep bringing this up, but like, a Disappointment River, my last book, I guess it struck me th this idea of like, is it North America or is it Canada, Canada or is it the United States as an America? Uh, when Mackenzie did his trip in the 18th century, it was nothing like it was it wasn't claimed by um, by Brit well, it was claimed by many. It was claimed by the United States and Britain and the Spanish in some places and and everything else. Like it was discovering what it was, and I think that's true of the Yukon as well. The place was discovering what it was, and yes, there were borders, uh, certainly more than in the 18th century, but it it was very much in flux, especially for the people there. Um, I mean, when there was famine in Dawson City. John Healy, who was one of the entrepreneurs, business tycoons, uh, who was an American, he wrote to the American government to come and establish martial law on the Canadian side of the border to bring food in, hmm. right? So it, you have these, the tensions that you're talking about. Um, was it an American story or Canadian story or both? And I think the answer is both. Yeah, I agree. And, and certainly you see it with colonial forces on both sides where there's a lot more free movement for colonial folks than there are for, than there is for the indigenous peoples and their movement tends to get restricted violence gets put onto them and that is 
the case when you look at both American and Canadian history. So certainly the, on the colonial sense, it is a history of both countries. Absolutely. I mean, and it it's not, I mean, there's parallels. It's not exact. I mean, you, right. you have all your treaties with the railroads in a way that we don't um, down on this side of the border. But when it comes to, you know, fighting the indigenous nations and then pushing them off their land, I mean, again, Sam Steele, who was the commander of the Northwest Police up in Dawson City, he is still the commander of the last military engagement on Canadian soil against the Cree, you know, mm-hmm. so he is, he fought in combat, you know, before as a younger man, before accepting this assignment in the Klondike. So as people will come to this book and I hope they enjoy it, I certainly did. But what do you think the relevance is for a modern audience over 100 and you know, 20 years later, here we are in 2021. What do you think the, the value of telling the story now is? And what do you think an audience can expect to potentially take away from the book? Yeah, so I have two contradictory answers to that. On the one hand, um, I think it's effective counter-programming. If you're sick of the news, it's a chance to think about something different. And I think there's real value <laughs> yeah. in taking a break from the news sometime and immersing yourself in another story. But there are there are certainly parallels. I mean, the the Great Panic of 1893 bears a suspicious parallel to the Great Recession in the mid 2000s. Banks are underwater. You know, banks fail and mortgages are underwater, and the unemployment rate shoots up, and people are looking for a solution. And it just, you know, in my country, uh, people voted for a presidential candidate that came down a golden staircase or a golden escalator. Um, and in 1897, they followed the gold to the Klondike, where they heard that, you know, the gold would solve all their problems. That was laying on the ground like Easter eggs, like in plain sight. Um, there's also, you know, so the economic situation is similar. Uh, there's a parallel I think people will see. But then also, if it wasn't exactly a conspiracy theory of what of of, you know, um, of what was up in the Klondike, it was certainly like a Ponzi scheme. And people were sold a, you know, a, a, a unfair bill of goods. And there is, I mean, obviously we live in a conspiracy theory ridden world right now where, you know, what can you believe and can you believe what's in the newspaper? Uh, and people should definitely not have believed what was in the newspaper in 1897. I like to think newspapers are, I've written for some of them. I think they're better now, but there is, you know, this suspicion um, and what people can be taken in by, um, I think is, you know, there's a parallel there. I guess the last thing I would say, too, is this idea that, you know, so many people would face danger and death and drowning and starvation and like, oh, I can't believe people would do that. I mean, that is happening all over the world today. I think we should forgive some of the stampeders in some way. There are people from sub-Saharan Africa crossing the Sahara Desert to try to get to Europe. And there's people from all over Latin America trying to get to the United States. Um, And they are escaping economic hardship and taking on tremendous um, dangers in a way that a lot of Stampeders did as well. So the parallels are not perfect, but I mean, what's the old adage? History doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And I think there's a lot of rhyming here. Yeah, I think that's really interesting to to think of it in those terms. That the the risks people will take to their own personal well being potentially uh, to either get out of situations or to find uh, security in in other situations, and that is a really interesting parallel. That's something I hadn't thought about, and I do wonder if just given your background, your experience, if that's one of these layers that you can bring to it because you you've done a lot more than be a professional historian. And I don't want to denigrate professional historians, mostly because I am one, but uh, (laughs) you know, we, we can tend to get very focused on our subjects and what we do. And occasionally we can't get blinders on. So having, thinking about it in those terms that that you just laid out, uh, that's really fascinating to me. So do you think that just, that's one of those things that just given your background that you have those insights that maybe those of us who our professional historians might not have the the same scope of experience to think about in those terms? Well, I also would never want to denigrate academic <laughs> historians, um, even though I'm not one. But I, I think so. I mean, I, I've i been in Tripoli in Libya, where um, 
you know, it is just absolutely full of people from Niger and Cameroon and Nigeria, and they are absolutely desperate to get across the Mediterranean and get to Italy. And I think that demographically, you know, young people, young men of a certain age going and trying to, you know, they, the, the difference is, you know, Stampeders read in a newspaper and these young men from Niger looked at it on their phones, but what they see is a land of opportunity. And if I can just physically get myself through this terrible, you know, awful hardship, then everything is going to be get better, you know, once I get there. And so, yeah, I guess I, I have some of that lived experience where I, I do see those parallels. I think, I don't think it's a stretch to, to make some of those comparisons. Well, we certainly encourage everybody to check out the book uh, for for that reason and the reasons we talked about. I I really enjoyed it. And again, the title, Stampede, Gold Fever and Disaster in the Klondike. Brian, where can people find more information about the book, buy the book, and maybe some of the other work that you've mentioned so far? Yes, you can, you can buy the book at um, hopefully your local bookstore, but also, you know, bookstores across Canada and online. Um, and you can find my work at briancastner.com. I'm also easily findable on Twitter, Brian underscore Kastner. Unfortunately, I spend way too much time on Twitter, uh, <laughs> but you can you can find more there. So any any one of those ways you can get a hold of me. Well, yeah, definitely encourage everybody to check it out. You know, doom scrolling in the pandemic uh, has sort of... We've yeah, all been there. We've all, we've been, all there. been there. <laughs> it definitely happens. Uh, so uh, so definitely check all that out. Brian, thank you so much for doing this and congratulations on the book. Thank you. It's been really fun talking to you. So there you have it. My discussion with Brian Kastner. I, of course, thank him for the time. And once again, the book is Stampede, Gold Fever, and Disaster in the Klondike. And I do thank our friends over at Penguin Random House for helping to set this one up. So that will do it for the show this week. Thank you, everybody, for listening as we are back from our hiatus. The plan is to resume the weekly episodes here. So keep an eye out on the feed for that. And do subscribe if you have not yet. You'll get all those future episodes. Of course, like, comment, rate, do all those other things. Helps us beat the algorithms as uh, we continue to try to grow the show here do have some plans in the works for some larger changes to the show as we continue to move through the summer keep everybody up to date on what those are as we move through the summer but i'm very excited about what is going to be coming up on the show of course you're always welcome to let me know what you want to hear on the show history slam at gmail.com you can find me on twitter at the sean graham and as always head on over to activehistory.ca all of our past episodes are there plus some other terrific work that's been done over the past six weeks or so so always enjoy seeing the work that comes out over on active history so we'll be back with you again next week but until then if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.